uh, I'll, I'll touch on some of these other issues uh, that we're, we're currently uh, faced with. Um, before we start taking any questions, uh, Mayor or Chairman, anybody from the legislature uh, have any thoughts that they want to share? I think you did a good job covering um, most of the major topics on, on things, Senator. And I think uh, we're all, uh, and of course, Mayor, you did as well for the aid. I think the county's in the same position that the city's in and a lot of these localities are. We're concerned about the state's ability to pocket money from uh, in, in terms of aid. So we'd like to see it go directly to the municipalities as well, because uh, every time money goes through the state, less comes back. So, um, yeah. but uh, yeah, we're all looking forward to hearing what uh, the, the residents have to say tonight. So yeah, let's go right Thank to the you. questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, let's, uh, Emmanuel, if you'd be so kind and unmute Ms. Strauss. Okay, Janice Strauss, uh, I've press the ask to unmute button. So if you could just, there you go. I think we're, we're on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I have to tell you straight up front, I'm one of those people who thinks that survey was rather biased. So I'm in the, F, in, in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to zero in on one question um, because it's been a bugaboo of mine for a while. And that's number seven, where you asked, um, do you support the government's proposal to provide 70% and uh, annual funding more to the MTA than to the DOT. Um, almost every town hall meeting I've been to, you've said something negative about New York City. Now, I want you to know I am not from New York City, <laughs> um, but downstate, so I, I did some research and, and I found in several different articles that talk about how Upstate New York pays $20 billion per year in taxes, but gets back 34 billion. That comes from downstate. Downstate pays more than, in fact, they pay, it's interesting, they pay approximately 70% of the taxes. So it's interesting that this says that 70% of the money would go to MTA rather than DOT. And in fact, you don't mention that the governor's budget moves $145 million from the MTA to the state's general fund. So I have, you, you can defend that if you'd like, but I have a request. And my request is, could you try a little harder to be nonpartisan and get us all to work together and give credit where credit is due, that is downstate is paying so much more, give them some credit and maybe that would help bring us together instead of dividing us. So that, that's kind of my question. What else could you do to help bring us together? Okay. Sure. I, I appreciate your question. Uh, and of course, we can always uh, agree to disagree. Um, I've been in your company many times and we've discussed a, a whole host of issues. Uh, let me share some facts with you. Okay. Um, the MTA is a bottomless money pit. Uh, they're currently operating at a deficit of $16 billion. So we have fought very, very hard uh, for parity when it comes to transportation. So the point I'm making by way of that question is this is that um, I firmly believe that our roads, our bridges um, are just as important, are as equally as important uh, as any road or bridge in New York City. So what we have done consistently uh, year after year is, has fought for, have, have fought for parity. Meaning this, if we're going to fund the MTA and I'm just looking down uh, at, at what the numbers are uh, this year, uh, funding the MTA at 10.3 billion, uh, but only funding the DOT capital plan at 5 billion, I take exception to that. Uh, because uh, again, not to be repetitive, but our roads and bridges are just as important as those are in New York City. Now, I've recognized the fact that uh, New York City, uh, maybe not in this pandemic, this world, this global pandemic world in which we're currently living, um, however, uh, is an economic driver, right? Um, there are uh, much of the tax base uh, it is yes in New York City. The point or the argument that I'm making is that um, we too uh, pay our taxes. And yes, we can have this debate about how much, how much tax uh, money is raised or revenue is raised in New York versus the state. You know what I'm saying uh, respectfully is that uh, we are as equally as important as uh, everyone else in New York City. And if we're going to fund roads and bridges uh, in the five boroughs at X amount of dollars, why then we should be funding roads and bridges in upstate New York outside the five boroughs at the same amount of money. It is, it's, it's fair and equitable 
uh, in terms of the distribution uh, of state dollars. You raised the point that uh, the governor uh, took $145 million from the MTA uh, and put it into the general fund. We refer to that as a sweep uh, or better uh, in, in my own terminology, stealing, right? Rather than uh, keeping the $145 million in a bottomless money pit uh, known as the MTA that has been so grossly uh, mismanaged when it comes to uh, uh, fiscal issues. He's taken more money out of the MTA and is using it for other purposes. Um, and again, I'll just end here. I'm just uh, deeply concerned that, uh, and you know, any one of these legislators, uh, the chairman or the mayor, uh, please chime in just about the importance, please, of uh, our local roads uh, our uh, bridges. So uh, Janice, uh, before the mayor, the chairman of the legislator speak, I'm not trying to be partisan uh, in terms of uh, the question or, or continuously raising this issue. I happen to think uh, maybe I'm wrong and maybe all of you, my constituency, uh, feel the same way as Janice does, or maybe you feel differently. I just feel very strongly about uh, ensuring that uh, our potholes get filled. Uh, and uh, our bridges are um, up to uh, code or, or uh, in, in, in not, not in a state of disrepair. So with that, uh, Mayor or, or Chairman. Sure, uh, and I'll try to be uh, very brief on, on this, but I'll just say that, you know, as mayor, uh, when I go door to door uh, talking to residents or uh, when I receive calls here, uh, the condition of neighborhood streets is something that I hear uh, a lot about. Uh, there are 151 miles of streets uh, in the city of Binghamton. And one of the things that we've been advocating for from the state uh, is more uh, what's called CHIPS funding. And, and the reason for that is, is the, the, the primary cost of fixing your, your neighborhood street, regardless of where you live, um, the, the costs are very similar. It's not the asphalt on your road. It's, the, it's fixing the water and sewer lines uh, that are underneath your street. And if we're gonna fix a street, we wanna fix it the right way. So that's the water and the sewer lines under the street, that's fixing your sidewalk and curbs. And the federal government requires us to fix the intersections uh, on these streets as well to make them uh, handicap accessible. Otherwise you risk losing uh, a lot of uh, state and federal reimbursements. And so, you know, unfortunately uh, the state does not provide uh, a whole lot of money to municipalities uh, to fix neighborhood streets. So that puts uh, village officials and mayors in a very difficult position where uh, you can choose to fix the streets the wrong way, which is you ignore the water and sewer lines underneath. You simply just uh, fix the, the asphalt. You know, it's called milling and paving. You mill it off and you put a couple inches on um, and know that, you know, the residents don't see what's underneath. But what happens is every winter, and you see this all over the place, uh, a street will be redone and then a water or sewer line uh, will break because of the cold temperatures and you have to carve up that uh, newly paved street and put a patch on it, right? And so, you know, a lot of us don't wanna do that because it makes our streets ugly. It's very inefficient. And so, you know, we wanna do it the right way, but the only alternative is to, you have to borrow money or try to get state grants. And the state has made a lot of state money available in the form of grants, but it's always after the fact uh, to fix your water and sewer lines after they break. And, and so there's not necessarily a lot of flexibility with regards to that money. And so that's one of the reasons why um, you know, we focus a lot on streets because the condition of your streets will impact your property values. Um, you know, it, it's, an, it's an important quality of life issue. Um, and of course you have to drive on it every day and uh, it impacts you know, damage to your car, et cetera. Um, so it, it is, you know, I'd say uh, taxes uh, in streets and crime you know, probably among like the top three things uh, that I hear uh, in the city of Binghamton. And as, as uh, you know, before I hand it back uh, to you, Senator, there was, someone made a comment um, in the question about uh, city, county, and state taxes. I can only speak for uh, myself in your city of Binghamton taxes, but uh, we've continued to either hold the line or provide uh, property tax cuts to commercial and uh, residential taxpayers. And I have committed in my state of the city address, which I did a couple of weeks ago, that for the year 2022, that at a bare minimum, we'll hold the line on taxes and um, with the, the potential of cutting them again for a, a seventh year. So I did want to at least uh, a comment on the, the city aspect of that question in the question box. Senator, thank you. Senator, if I could as well. I, I mean, I, I agree with both, uh, both you and the mayor. 
The county has about 343 miles of roads that we maintain. We have 105 bridges with you know, spans of 20 feet or more and approximately 3,500 culverts uh, in the county as well uh, that, uh, that we, we're required to maintain. Um, you know, we, we all are looking at it from, from similar perspectives. And, and Janice, I, I understand and, and can appreciate the, the sentiment of trying to make sure that things are not partisan and, uh, you know, I, I looked at the question. I, I didn't read it the same way that you did. And uh, I, I look at it, it's just a question of priorities. And I think the underlying point that we're all trying to make is, is about fairness. And I think that the trap sometimes when we're dealing with the state versus dealing with local government, it's always about what they focus on when we start talking about who pays for what and how much uh, and what the percentages are. So I think it, part of it that I would just caution is, we always have to be careful about what they're including because I've seen some of the same studies that I suspect or reports that you've mentioned that were 70% or, or something along those lines. And uh, the sources on it don't always talk about all the other underlying expenses. I know the Senator is, uh, is familiar with this and so is the mayor. Uh, there are so many different lines that are hid throughout the budget that in different projects and different ways to pay for things that you really never know the full amount uh, and they, they don't really have a real good way of, an, of auditing from New York City to, to uh, upstate. And I think that's part of the problem. The transparency issue is, is an issue. And the reason why it winds up, uh, I think being so divisive sometimes with upstate and downstate is because of a lack of transparency. And I think we'd all be better off if that was that was the standard in, in Albany rather than something that we have to continually ask for. As a, as a county legislator, for me, it, it's, it's difficult dealing with the state and the Senator's been extremely helpful uh, from our perspective, uh, because just for example, I mean, the, the county had to borrow upwards of $30 million at the end of, to satisfy last year's fiscal year. And $24 million of that was, was money that was owed to us from the state for services that were mandated to provide. And uh, so, when they start to do the accounting on whether you know New York City or or downstate pays more to upstate, uh, it doesn't always include the outstanding obligations that they have as well. So it's uh, or or they'll count that that's something that's paid when we don't have the money. So I, I just I think it depends on 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 what you're looking at and what uh, what time period. Uh, what the underlying costs or assumptions are on it as well. But I think the the point that you were getting at. Is, is about fundamental fairness and being transparent. I, I do think that we're all trying to do that. I, I do. It's a good point, Chairman. And uh, Janice, I'm just looking at your comment. Um, I, I just wanna make one last point on this and then I'm gonna take uh, Mr. Capelli's question. Um, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you're, uh, you're saying uh, don't fix downstate roads and bridges. For me, again, it's just uh, to the Chairman's point, it's just about fundamental fairness. Uh, I'm just saying, if we're going to address our infrastructure needs at, again, X amount of dollars, let's do that across the board, right? Let's ensure that we're, we're repairing everybody's roadways, everybody's bridges uh, at the same dollar amount um, and not letting uh, roads and bridges uh, go into a, a state of decay or, or disrepair um, here in our particular region. Uh, Emmanuel, if you would be so kind, uh, and I've asked the staff uh, in the chat section, and you'll see it at some point, um, if you'll see uh, the comptroller's report on the MTA, I think that's, in, that's a, um, an independent, impartial uh, document that you can read about um, really uh, an organization or an agency that has been really largely unaccountable um, to, uh, to folks. So, uh, Emmanuel, if you'd be so kind, uh, if you could just unmute uh, Mr. Capelli and uh, we'll take his question. And then I'm, I'm just looking at the comments as well. Uh, Daryl Hartzell is having a, a problem uh, raising his hand. So, Daryl, we'll be sure to get to you uh, as well. Hi, Senator Akshar. This is Grace. Grace and Michael Capelli. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Um, my question is, I recently heard there was a proposal for New York State and they want to mandate that the COVID-19 vaccination um, is forced on everyone um, for a penalty. Um, where is that and, and is that moving forward and what's being done with this? Because you mentioned that 
uh, New Yorkers are leaving because the state, <laughs> I think that infringement would definitely be a reason uh, my husband and I would leave. Um, so where, where does that stand? Yeah, listen, I, I think, um, Grace, I think there may be uh, some discussions being had um, by some members of the legislature, but from my perspective, um, uh, two things I would say. Uh, I don't think that that issue will uh, grow legs, if you will, uh, and actually come to the floor of, of either house. Um, Amanda Holzer, my legislative director, uh, is on the line. So, of course, uh, this issue we flagged um, many months ago, uh, obviously, when, when we, we heard about it as well. Um, but you can count on my uh, not supporting something like that, um, you know, in the event that it ever came to the floor. Uh, if you'd be so kind and just um, just send, maybe you've already done this, but send us an email uh, tomorrow, uh, akshar at nysenate.gov. Uh, we will flag this issue uh, for you. And then if in fact uh, there's any movement on the issue, uh, we'll be sure to, to let you know uh, about that as well. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I don't wanna mess up uh, Ms. Perrine, uh, Gina Perrine I see is next. If I've mispronounced your name, I apologize. Danny, if you'd be so kind. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, I'm grateful and appreciative of um, your focus on uh, the municipalities and the monies coming hopefully from the federal government. But I, I uh, am very concerned with the big picture, with what's going on in Washington and the direction that the current administration has moved this country in just one month. Because if, it, if they continue to spend the way they are, there's not going to be anything trickling down to anybody. There's not going to be jobs. And I'm very concerned about this. Um, I would like to get involved. And I know a lot of other people who would like to do whatever we can to be an influence in the politics in our local regions and on a national level. Um, I tried contacting Broome County Republicans. They had a website, they had a calendar. There was nothing on the calendar. I emailed them and they said, well, we're not doing anything. There are a lot of angry people there are a lot of concerned people, and I think we're, we want to do something. Um, I think you, there should be a way to mobilize us to, petition, to get petitions, to go door to door, to inform each other what we can do um, to get Cuomo's executive um, orders rescinded, all the way to supporting candidates that uh, Actually, I'll be honest, I watched um, Trump's speech at CPAC. There wasn't anything he said that I don't agree with. And if our elections are not fixed, there's no guarantee, there's no point in even voting. And, and the American people feel this. So there's, there's a lot of issues that I think people need to be educated about. And I think if if we could put the information into their hands, we, we could have a force that could work for you, for us, for New York State, and for the government. How do we get involved on a local level to move these things forward? Yeah, you know, you know we do, it's a great point. Um, and because you had mentioned the, the Broom Republican Party, uh, I'll see to it that uh, the chairman uh, does in fact, or somebody from the executive committee does in fact reach out to you. Uh, I apologize that you haven't heard from anybody, but um, you know, it's entirely possible that they were, uh, not, it's not actually, it, it is uh, actually very possible uh, that they've been very, very busy preparing petitions uh, because we're entering that season uh, where it's now time to pass petitions for people to get on the ballot who are currently running this year. And I would just encourage everybody, regardless of your politics, uh, to Gina's point, get, get involved. Uh, it's, it's incredibly important. And really, this is why we're doing what we're doing tonight, right? Uh, we obviously, we want to hear from everyone. Uh, we want to hear your position uh, on issues. And I've taken a position uh, since being elected, and I know the chairman, uh, the county legislators, and the mayor uh, believe this. We may have ours next to our name, but we represent everyone, uh, whether they are uh, liberal members of this community, 
conservative members of this community, Republican, Democrat. Uh, I said this, um, just uh, bringing up Ms. Strauss again. Uh, I've been in Ms. Strauss's company many times, uh, either in person or in virtual town halls. There are times, Janice, I'm, I'm gonna say this and maybe I'm wrong, but there, from time to time, we agree on issues. Uh, from time to time, we disagree. And I think that's good, right? Because uh, we should in fact be able to have these, these um, conversations. And Gina, the only other thing I would say in closing is that every vote counts. Right. I mean, literally, if you look at NY 22 uh, and how long it took uh, to settle that uh, congressional race uh, and how close that race was, um, I don't know. You could look at any race throughout the, this nation. Um, and that was so close. I think that's a perfect example of, of every vote counting. So we'll make sure that somebody reaches out to you and um, uh, you can have that conversation and, and make sure that the people give you an opportunity to get involved, because it sounds like that's exactly what you want to do. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, Emmanuel, if you'd be so kind, Mr. Nixon. All right, Mr. Nixon, if you could please uh, unmute yourself. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to stay on the, uh, our, our transportation. I uh, manage a local staffing company. And uh, one of the biggest problems I see right now is we're getting an influx of people who don't drive. And with these businesses in the corporate parks, Broome and uh, Kirkwood, the bus schedules aren't conducive to the shifts that these, these customers are running. We can't get people out there because a, a, a large majority of these people do not drive. So I have a couple of questions. What's involved in reevaluating the bus schedules and do the business owners have any say on what their needs are? I am going to defer, if you'd be so kind, uh, to the chairman, uh, just to speak a little bit. Obviously, it's a Broome County issue, and um, I'm happy to offer my thoughts on, on, on public transportation after the chairman uh, is, is through. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, Mr. Nixon, the, the first thing that I would I'd suggest, if, if you haven't done it already, is to contact Greg Kilmer. Uh, and if you, uh, you provide us your email or you email uh, us here tonight, and just uh, we'll, we're, we're going to put that contact information up. If you send us an email, we'll get you the contact information for Mr. Kilmer. They have looked at changing different uh, bus schedules out there depending on the need. A lot of the uh, the schedules that the, the commissioner work on uh, is based on on usage. So if the usage is there and they can justify it, they are amenable to to changing uh, routes occasionally on it. I know the corporate park has been uh, one of the places that they've uh, they've looked at before. I'm sure if, if you feel that there's a need there and it's something that they can demonstrate, they certainly would be open to discussing it. Greg is a is a very reasonable individual in particular, and uh, I I mean I understand the the fundamental argument underneath that that you, if you're going to have a business there, you need to be able to move people to that uh, business back and forth. So um, if you if you contact us. We'll be more than happy to set up either a, a conversation with Mr. Kilmer or we'll see what we can do to help facilitate that. Chair, sure, if I can if I can add to that, they are doing a transportation study right now. So that input I think would be very good to have. Yeah, because I've had conversations with other staff and agencies. So I manage people ready, but I know they're all having a, a same issue with getting people out to work. I mean, there'd be people working right now if we could get them out there. Yeah. And in fact, Willow Run is now running, uh, has their own van and they're picking people up. That's how bad it's gotten where our, co our, our company has had to put a van driver and go pick people up. No, I, I certainly understand. It's not the first time that we've we've heard it. I'm, I'd have to double check the routes right now to see how close they are to the, uh, uh, the corporate park or if it's, uh, if the service goes there right now, I'm not, without checking the routes, I'm not sure what the, what the frequency is in that area. But if, like I said, if the volume is there and they can justify it, Greg has been open to considering that in the past and we've made changes to routes uh, previously. So if that's, uh, usually it's not the route to that uh, as much as it's, where does the route go next and what hubs are available and what time it's usually the, the timing issue on it as well. So it's it sounds simple and, uh, and I certainly understand it from, from your perspective, but it, it can get complicated quickly, but we're really willing to try and work through. 
the best can and certainly can get a conversation with Mr. Kilmer on that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I see Emmanuel has posted uh, the poll results uh, for everybody on the line and we've got really good participation again uh, this evening. Uh, we we're a little bit north of 100 people. Currently there are 96 people, but uh, you can see them in the chat in, in the group chat uh, section. In terms of rescinding the governor's emergency executive powers, 82% uh, of you uh, agree that we should do that. 8% say no and 11 uh, don't know. So just for everybody's edification, we, uh, the Republican conference uh, in the state Senate, um, again, we're in the minority, many of you know that, uh, but we have attempted uh, on 17 occasions uh, since the beginning of the legislative session to repeal those emergency powers. And we have been met with uh, great opposition by our friends uh, across the aisle, um, really not wanting to uh, take back um, their control of state government, which is somewhat strange to me because uh, there are currently 20 of us in the Republican conference. There are 14 members of the Democratic conference that um, are supporting a bill to rescind those. So the other day, that's 34 members who represent a little bit more than 11 million people in this state. So that's a majority of us. Um, and the leadership, uh, Andrea Stewart-Cousins uh, is refusing to let that bill come to the floor to take an up or a down vote. Um, I'm of the opinion that uh, there are a majority of members, Republicans and Democrats alike, that want to vote on the bill. We should, in fact, be able to take, uh, take the vote, which we haven't been able to do uh, just yet. And 92% of you believe that we should, um, in fact, have an independent investigation into the governor's handling of the nursing home issue. Manuel, if you'd be so um, kind, please unmute Daryl. Hartzell. Again, if you want to ask a question, just go down to that reaction section and uh, hit the raise hand button. We'll get to everybody's question. We appreciate everybody's um, involvement. Darl, if you could just uh, hit the unmute button. There you go. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my, I, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, I also struggled with that question. Do you support the governor's proposal to provide 70% more in funding annually to the MTA and to the DOT? Um, I answer don't know because I didn't feel that I had enough information to, um, to answer that question in a reasonable way. And from what Mr. Reynolds said, you know, he indicated that it, it would be very difficult for the average person to, to really understand all the ins and outs and all the finances of this. So it seems to me that if it is so complicated, that's more of an argument not to phrase the question that way than to keep the question. So I'm gonna suggest that that, that question is, well, for me, it was just impossible. Uh, and would be extremely difficult for anyone to make a reasoned response to that if it's so difficult to understand. So that was all I wanted to say about that. Senator, if I may. Of course, yep. Um, so I, I did not say that the average person could not understand it. I, my, my only caution on the, uh, the way that things are calculated sometimes is that you need to be comprehensive in how you approach it, because it's relatively easy for individuals that are well versed in in either uh, accounting or, or financials from the state's perspective to take things out of context and report it in a way that uh, justifies whatever position or agenda that they they potentially have. That was my caution. I did not uh, at any time imply, nor do I think that. Uh, the, an average person couldn't uh, decipher the finances for uh, for the state or for for local governments. In fact, we passed legislation at the county to make it easier for individuals to do exactly that. It's called the daylight legislation that's on Broome County's uh, website was to, to try and provide more transparency uh, on uh, issues of, of finance in government. And uh, from, from my perspective, I, the, the question was uh, a question that was at the 50,000 foot level, and uh, it's, it's probably hard to get any, any more narrow than that on the, on the question that, they, uh, that the Senator had put up, uh, just, just because you probably, based on what 
the, the point, I think the underlying point that you're making requires more detail on it. And which, you know, if you had a question, I'm sure the Senator or anybody on their, uh, their staff, if you got it to them, they would certainly provide whatever information you needed to answer the question. But yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, well, I'll definitely look into that. Um, because I, at this point, wouldn't really know what an appropriate split would be. Um, I mean, Senator Akshar has, has stated what he thinks it could be, but uh, so w where would, so the daylight legislation, um, this is something that would happen in the future? So the daylight legislation that I was referring to is at the county level. I'm suggesting okay. that they would need to do something similar at the state level to help. And All right. But there's there's information out there. The, the the underlying point for me is that you just you need to be sure what you're looking at before uh, and who's who's providing it to make sure that it's that it's truly unbiased. So somebody who wanted to for, formulate their own opinion on this particular question, where would they go to look for that? Uh, multiple what do you sources. suggest I Google? Uh, the New York Comptroller's uh, web page has got plenty of information on it, but you'd probably have to. Uh, look at a couple couple of other sources. If if you again, we're going to put up contact information. Um, if you if you want some help uh, in where you should be looking for financial information, I'm sure that we could we could get that to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. You know the other uh, the only other thing I would say, Adarl, is I think uh, the overarching question is: Do you agree or disagree with parity? And really, that's that. That is the uh, ultimate argument from for me, and from my perspective. Again, I, I think I was clear in that um, downstate roads and bridges critically important, right? Upstate roads and bridges critically important. Uh, the argument that I'm making, and I try to do it in the most respectful way. I mean, look again in terms of the MTA and the fiscal mismanagement. We've posted in the in the chat section a link to the comptroller's report. And remember, he is an independently elected, he or she, depending on who's serving, is an independently elected official in the state of New York. Uh, and uh, currently, uh, Comptroller DiNapoli uh, speaks uh, about the fiscal mismanagement and unaccount uh, there being a lack of accountability. So my argument has always been um, to achieve true parity when we're talking about uh, the infrastructure needs of the state. I'm not pitting upstate against downstate. I'm just, say, I'm just saying, let's achieve true parity uh, when we're dealing with uh, these um, particular issues. So, Senator, can I make a comment on that? Of point? course. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and actually, your, your, your last statement um, is actually, you know, I just wanted to piggyback. And, 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 and the governor um, historically at times has done just that. And I, I think in the spirit of what uh, the first question was about you know, how can we, you know, work together and do things a little bit differently is that it shouldn't be one or the, one or the other is it's that, you know, if the governor wants to make something a reality, he finds the money somewhere. He, he is able to do what he wants to do uh, in this situation. He, he, he is pitting, you know, the DOT versus the, the MTA. And that's not right because, um, you know, one isn't worthy and one is, you know, unworthy. You know, they both have a different set of, of specific needs and service a different population. And, and your, you know, comment, which I think is right on, it's, it's a more about, you know, equity. How do we, um, you know, identify the, the true comprehensive fashion of what's needed upstate um, and also continue to, to, to do what we need, need, need downstate? Because what happens is, and we see this particularly in the assembly, where um, you know a higher concentration of the members are from downstate, that these resources um, you know are not distributed equitably, and I and I think that's what your point is: is let's you know uh, fight for our fair share, not necessarily you know taking away from you know one or the other, but just you know equity. And, and unfortunately, we're we're all too often in these situations where you know, municipal aid is pitted against uh, education aid or DOT resources are pitted against M MTA resources. And it's all about, as the chairman said, you know, at the higher level, how are we putting these, these budgets together in a more equitable fashion? It's a great point. Um, thank you for that, Mayor. Uh, I, think we're, I think we're all in agreement. And, um, you know, so I guess sometimes it's all about the way you frame a, a response or and, and I appreciate the feedback, quite frankly, on the way that the questions um, from time to time are worded.
I can tell you equivocally that that the team and I work uh, incredibly hard to try to frame these questions uh, the best way we can. And frankly, the back that we get helps us um, as we move forward. So we have um, four or six people who need to ask questions, but there is one in the, the uh, in group chat section by Judy uh, talking about the uh, blighted property. Do you mind uh, addressing that from uh, the perspective? And then uh, maybe chairman, somebody from the legislature uh, could address that as well. Sure, I, uh, I love talking about blight because it's a, it's a, it's a primary focus you know, in the city of Binghamton. There's so many different layers to it. Um, you know, in short, um, when I talk to you know, residents, if, if you live next to uh, a dilapidated or burned out eyesore, um, you, know, you want that demolished yesterday. You don't wanna have to live there. You don't wanna have to, if you have to drive by it on your way to and from work or for something in your neighborhood, uh, it impacts your overall quality of life. It erodes your, your neighborhoods. And there's a lot that municipalities can do, whether it's, you know, Binghamton or I see in the, the chat, it's about the town of Union, um, which, is, which is good because Binghamton and the town of Union actually have similar resources to address blight. And it comes in the source of community development block grant funding, which is money from the federal government that goes to what's called entitlement communities. So a lot of the money we use, not uh, all of it, but, you know, we use some uh, local taxpayer dollars, but we also use federal money. To, um, to attack blight. And one of the things that uh, we have been able to do by working with uh, Broome County, uh, Chairman Reynolds specifically, and the previous county executive is uh, we put together uh, an agreement that not only impacts Binghamton, but every municipality in Broome County. So we're able to uh, look at foreclosed properties that have um, past the point of no return that you can salvage and put back on the tax rolls financially, acquire them inexpensively, uh, demolish them and get the county to waive some of the asbestos costs, air monitoring costs, the cost to dispose of the properties at the landfill. But you know, when you do demolish the properties, you also need to have a plan for redevelopment. And you know, sometimes depending on the location, uh, if they're in a the neighborhood, the only thing you can do is work with an adjacent property owner to expand uh, their lot. Uh, you can look to try to do new housing on individual lots. But in the city, what we've tried to do is uh, do blight clusters because there are, you know, unfortunately, there are a, a many areas of the city where there's more than one blighted home next to each other. So we'll, we will acquire those properties, demolish them, and try to work with some of our partners on um, uh, on new investment, uh, commercial or residential development. Um, we have some great uh, records of success on doing that on the north side. Uh, we've par partnered with uh, Senator Akshar uh, on the north side on the $20 million workforce housing project at Canal Plaza, 48 units of uh, workforce housing. And we actually have a, a grocery store in there, which is a great partnership to service the residents of the north side. Um, that was one uh, four acre parcel that was going to be auctioned off uh, by the county, but we were able to work with Chairman Reynolds and uh, in the previous administration to uh, not auction it off to the highest bidder, but try to put together a proposal for best use. On another area of the north, of the north side, we uh, focused on seven blighted commercial uh, properties where we just uh, last week, uh, thanks to uh, Chairman Reynolds and the Senator opened a, a homeless housing uh, project that uh, services uh, homeless veterans, uh, homeless families, uh, victims of domestic violence, et cetera. Uh, but we also work with, uh, could be Habitat for Humanity, could be Opportunities for Broom, could be private individuals, so that they're not just you know, lots that, that uh, are mud pits or uh, overgrown in, in weeds. So it, you, you have to have a multifaceted approach. And, and the Broom County Land Bank, uh, which is uh, uh, through the, the Broom County Legislature as well, uh, is another great, uh, a partner. So what we try to do, and, and this can happen in the town of Union, and, and, and does uh, happen in the town of Union, is we get our partners together and we say, you know, what, what are the areas we want to focus on? And if, if, if you live, if, if you have one of these properties on your street, and if you're in the town of Union, you know, please uh, reach out to Chairman Reynolds, please reach out to your county legislator, because uh, if you're outside the city of Binghamton, that's exactly where you start. And there are resources uh, that are available <coughs> And we can help put together a plan to address uh, the demolition, the eradication of blight, and hopefully uh, redevelopment or investment um, in those neighborhoods. And I would say, um, you know, demolition is not the only way to address blight. Uh, there are some properties that can be rehabilitated that, that, that have not reached 
the point of no return where it just doesn't make sense to invest that much money into rehabilitating them. And there, there are programs as well that we can work to keep, you know, reinvest in something, whether it's a first time home buyer program or get a family uh, to live in there to, uh, you know, uh, expand the tax base as well, because um, you know, the goal is not just to demolish every single property and, and reduce that tax revenue, um, but to address the quality of life issues that are referenced and uh, uh, reinvest and rebuild communities. Because oftentimes what happens, it's like the, um, I use this analogy, the broken tooth and a smile of the neighborhood. You could have, you know, a, a very well-kept street. If one you know, blighted property sets in where, you know, somebody isn't living in there or it's abandoned. It becomes a magnet for criminal activity. Uh, it is not maintained properly. It begins to push other residents out of that neighborhood if there are, are criminal elements. And sometimes, in many cases, that's the, 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 the primary first step in how a neighbor, uh, neighborhood begins to uh, erode or spiral out of control. Um, Senator, if I may. Um, of course, yeah. The, uh, the mayor is ac absolutely right. So, uh, one of the reasons why this was brought to our attention was because of the work actually that the mayor was doing in the city of Binghamton and we were looking for other ways to be able to to build on that in other communities. So one of the things that we created was the land bank and uh, you know the legislators uh, and, and none of this happens. I, I, I got some credit for some of those things but uh, legislator O'Brien, legislator Shaw, legislator Baldwin and uh, legislator Hildebrand are all all part of the, the exact same team with this as well. And uh, we all work together to try and get these. And um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I believe Aaron, if you're, if you're listening, if you don't mind sharing your screen for a second, I'll give you an example of uh, one of the homes. Now this is one of the homes that uh, we have uh, acquired. We, the county takes it back in foreclosure because obviously nobody's living on it. So. I've driven past this house since I was in elementary school going to Ross Corners down uh, in, in Vestal on Old Oligo Road. I remember seeing it and in, in looking out the window at the bus uh, when I was a child. And you know, we, we finally got to a spot where the, the property came back in uh, on foreclosure, the county acquired it, and we had the land bank that we created. And the reason we created the land bank was because of problems like this. Up until the land bank existed, we didn't have a way to deal with a house like this. The county would have been in a spot where they may not have had the resources to be able to knock this down. But the land bank does because the land bank was designed to be able to apply for grants through the state and, and other programs to get money specifically for demolition. So this property and, and several other properties that all of you are probably familiar with in your neighborhood, especially if you're like, uh, in, in residents like, like I'm in that were victims of the flood from 2006, 2011, we had several homes where residents walked away from it because they just didn't have a viable option. And what happened is the, the neighbors are, are, are living next to some of these homes and trying to, you know, they're like people like me, they go out and they're mowing the neighbor's lawn because it's not maintained. They try to do everything they can to try and keep it. And, uh, you know, if you're lucky, you have res residents in your neighborhood like me that uh, or, or like some of you that will go out and take care of the property to the extent that you can. But, you know, I have an eight year old. I don't want them playing in a neighborhood like this where this is a possibility. And, you know, so we talked to the, the mayor uh, a while ago and we talked about it. Like, what, what were the barriers for municipalities? Well, we found out that, you know, the cost to acquire properties uh, was a barrier. So. If, if you had more money, what would you do? Well, we'd, we'd demo, uh, demolition the properties that needed to be demolition, but we'd save the properties that we could save and we'd reinvest in them. And that's exactly what we've done. The, the mayor is exactly right. You know, we've, we've torn down structures in Mr. Shaw's district uh, that were Christ the uh, King, and he was instrumental in bringing a new project to that, which is the Vines Garden. We've done projects across the, the county now and we, up until the land bank existed, we wouldn't have had a chance to be able to do it. Another good example where we worked with the land bank in private uh, partnership was with the, the senator, the mayor, and, uh, and, and the, the land bank of the county is 50 Front Street that turned a, a dilapidated building that was flood ravaged uh, on several floors that was, um, that needed to come down that we couldn't we couldn't have a viable solution until the land bank was involved with that. And all of the community partners, uh, Janice, you, you, you mentioned earlier about working together. 
this is a good example. Republicans, Democrats, didn't matter who it was. We all worked together to try and get that building down. So you'll, you'd be happy with that one. But, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a good example. And I think uh, when we get projects like this, the, the senators mentioned this before, the party affiliation, all that stuff goes right out the window. We're all focused on doing what's right for this community. And, and whether it's this project, whether it's uh, National Pipe over in, in the town of Union that's building a new corporate headquarters on a building that was an old EJ factory that needed to come down. These are the types of projects that we can all be proud of. And, and they're putting good usable property back in the tax way that people can use them. And in, in the places where you can't, they become green space and either the neighbors are buying them or in some cases the municipality might because it might get annexed to a, a park or something along those lines. So it's a great pro, uh, program and, and I'm, I'm so glad that what we've all been able to accomplish uh, when it comes to tearing down these, these structures and rehabbing the ones that we can as well. Okay, thank you for that. I know uh, that issue took up a few minutes. Um, I get it, but it's an important issue. And to the Capelli family, I think you had asked a question specifically about a blighted property on uh, Route 12 in Shenango Fork. So I would just uh, defer back uh, to the chairman to what he said. At the end of the um, town hall, we'll put up our numbers and our email addresses. So if there's a particular issue uh, or a property that's creating an issue, uh, I know you could start there uh, with the chair chairman and then um, you can go from there. Uh, I'm gonna call on uh, Pat Noble, please, Emmanuel, if you'd be so kind. And uh, I'm gonna get to everybody's questions and we'll try to speed this up uh, best we can. I know all of you have questions and they're equally as important. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, I would like to say, Mayor, like I really agree with you on uh, your comment about how different needs in the state are pitted against each other. Um, I work in a Medicaid clinic. Um, as we all know, especially with the pandemic, but even before that, um, a great many people in the, at least like in Binghamton and their, their surrounding um, towns, there's, there's great health need. Um, and those of us that provide Medicaid services because there's so much poverty also, we're completely flooded. Um, Caseloads, my own is up above 120. Other places are 150. This means that people, instead of seeing a counselor biweekly, which is effective treatment, are scheduled four or five, six weeks out. People that come looking um, for appointments um, have to wait. They're scheduled. They may they may get an appointment for for an intake, but they they and they may get in for intake because we're doing the open access. But then they have to wait weeks for that second one because the intake takes three appointments. Um, think we're getting a lot of people with PTSD. I have little ones, like little kids, like five years old with PTSD diagnoses. Um, and, and part of it with, as with the budget, with that across the board 20% cut, like even before that, the re Medicaid reimbursement was, it's like an insult to those that do hands-on. And what happens is, you, there, it's it's like this this game is the only word I can think of, but that's not because it sounds disrespectful. But OMH on the one hand is about um, it is is about the funding, you know, disbursement, making sure that somebody that doesn't deserve it or like if the work wasn't done, you know, like you don't you don't pay for something that's not happening, right? On the other hand, the clinics are trying to get money so that we can provide the service. So what ends up happening is we, um, as counselors, we're seeing people back to the back. Like typically 35 people a week. And that's if people get seven hours a day, 45 minute appointments, 15 minutes in between. These days, it's hard to get people to stop talking, right? So what happens is we end up working on the weekends to do the required documentation that OMH requires to meet compliance. If we don't meet compliance, then we lose money 
and the clinic like clinics can also be closed because we're not meeting compliance standards so it's this um it's like really like a rock in a hard place um and i don't know if mental health like with the budget coming up like what's in it um at this point one of the things that i like to strongly recommend that i happen to come across because what happens because of Medicaid, a lot of clinics go to this productivity model of management, which is absolutely incongruent with, with the service that we provide. You know, we're there for healing. You know, people have broken hearts, wounded souls, injured minds, and, and the healing is taking an excruciating long time to happen if it does because of be basically because of, of, of funding. Um, there was a doctoral dissertation on productivity I came across uh, more than a year by Dana Williams. Um, when I read it, I thought she must have been hanging out at the clinic because she really, she pretty much nailed the struggle in terms of those of us that give direct care and the clients that come to see us, um, we're we're past the, we're all past the point of exhausted. Like we're sharing the COVID fatigue that everyone else is experiencing. Plus, um, you know, exercising like compassion all day long. Plus, having to meet compliance. So, um, shortcuts as as. As uh, Dana Williams points out, a lot of times shortcuts are taken or things are missed. And then it's the individual counselor that's held responsible rather than the, we've developed a system of doing something that doesn't, doesn't really work. Yeah, you know, I, I we just did a, uh, we did a call the other day with uh, some folks over at the, the Greater Binghamton Health Center, specifically around the, the Children's Psychiatric Center. And mm. uh, there were part-time employees that were working 70 hours a week, part-time employees. Right. So uh, Pat, um, you know, you raise a very good point. It's a point that we've raised over the last couple of weeks, specifically around the budget and the budget hearings uh, about ensuring, and I'm going back to wants versus needs, right? Yes, the Medicaid mm. reimbursement system is completely broken. Um, but, um, you know, ensuring that we're getting these dollars, whatever dollars are available uh, to our most vulnerable populations, especially in this world of, uh, of COVID, there is an attempt uh, to uh, um, bring together um, OMH, OPWDD, and mm -hmm. OASIS. Right. So rather than right. having three state bureaucracies, having all of those agencies under one roof. And um, the bill was uh, actually on our committee agenda today, but it was removed at the last minute. And um, you know, I'm still trying to educate myself on that because even though there are three separate bureaucracies, I would respectfully argue that we, we're really failing, right? I think we have this fundamental obligation to take care of those who are most vulnerable, right? That's government's, I think, first... Mm -hmm responsibility. So it's an issue that we are um, closely monitoring. I will, um, I would love to have another follow-up conversation with you, uh, a sidebar conversation on the issue, just to be respectful of everybody's uh, mm -hmm. uh, time, of course, uh, that's on the, the call. Manny, could you uh, unmute uh, Rob? Is it Handmaker, Rob? I'm sorry, I don't want to mispronounce your last name. Everybody screws mine up and that's okay. Um, just don't want to do that to you, nor do I want to wake up your little one that's with you. <laughs> Well, no, I was going to tell you, thanks for putting him to sleep. It makes it a whole lot easier tonight to not have to do that. Um, I got two quick questions. Um, the first, and the first one may be a part of the poll on rescinding the, uh, the executive, uh, the, the ability for the governor for all the executive mandates. So my question is this, when, when can, or when do we think we're going to reopen the state with the, the travel restrictions. Like right now, you gotta get two tests to come into the state, which kind of limits ability to be able to maybe visit some family that might be out of state. Um, and, and, and so like, that's just kind of like, if, is there any idea, you know, a lot of, you know, we're one of the few states that has those rules and restrictions. So that was kind of one question, but my, and my, probably my more significant question relates to my six-year-old. 
Um, and is there anything that you or the, the, the county legislature or anybody else can do to help get schools reopened more? Um, it really, it, it really is uh, getting frustrated. We, we live in Vestal and uh, it, it's two days a week. And, um, and even that is, you know, the other days are very limited um, as far as what's happening educationally. And uh, our little guy has some, some special challenges where at-home education is non-existent. Um, it, it really is difficult. And so just wondering, is there anything that you, that any of you can to help with that process? Um, you know, there, it sounds like things are happening, but it feels like it's, uh, it, it's a snail race and a turtle um and, and getting anything done for getting kids back in school more so just wondering if you could speak to that yeah let me just address the first issue i'm going to have the chairman address the second one because we're currently working on uh on the vestal school issue and uh dan uh, chairman Reynolds has been a great great partner in that um so you heard me say during the outset uh, in terms of the executive orders i mean we've tried now 16 or 17 times to rescind those that expire at the end of april um but you know the time has really come uh to to go back to the way state government is supposed to work, right? The legislature is a co-equal branch of government. And in the beginning, honestly, if I'm, I'm being honest with myself and everybody on the line, I thought to myself, uh, what, a, what an unprecedented time we're in, right? It calls for really unprecedented measures, not as though the governor or the state legislature had a playbook uh, on dealing with COVID-19, maybe on global pandemics and such. But the, the point I make is, is I, I think having to make uh, changes on the fly would be a reasonable conversation to have, right? But the governor has changed some 250 laws, right, by executive order. And that, that is highly problematic. It, it really, really is because it has affected uh, people's everyday life, uh, the way we go about uh, doing business. So I don't have a good answer for you, uh, Rob, quite frankly, on the when does, when do we get back to normal? I'd like to think that we're slowly getting there. Um, but clearly uh, to some, uh, not, not quick enough. And with respect to, uh, I, I get confused sometimes listening to Dr. Fauci and the advice that we're getting uh, because it seems to change often. And quite frankly, in terms of the confusion, a lot of these executive orders um, and the mandates and the edicts that are coming from the governor by way of his emergency powers are creating that consternation amongst communities throughout the state, right? Because one day it's okay to go to, I'm making this up, but you get the point. It's okay to go to basketball practice, the next it's not. Um, so in terms of the education piece, I just make one, one particular uh, point and then I'll ask the chairman to opine. Um, the gov and I said this the other day uh, when the chairman was on the line, the governor made, I think, uh, a political decision when dealing with public education uh, uh, and COVID-19. He didn't want to take on the teachers union. And I don't mean any disrespect to any teacher on the line. Uh, he didn't want to take on the very powerful union uh, in dealing with this issue. So he said, I'm not going to make the decision. Uh, yes, we have all of these um, um, guidelines that you must follow, so on and so forth, but I'm leaving it up to the local school districts uh, to make uh, their own decisions. And that really has been problematic statewide, not just in Vestal or Broome County or in my Senate district, because <laughs> to your point, Union Endicott is doing it one way, Vestal's doing it another way, Shenango Bridge, Shenango, Va uh, excuse me, Shenango Valley, Shenango Forks, the list goes on and on. And it just created a lot of uh, aggravation, quite frankly, uh, for parents like yourself uh, in dealing with this particular issue. But Chairman, if you'd be so kind just to quickly um, uh, just give Rob some insight uh, as to the Vestal issue specifically. So uh, Rob, uh, the Senator and I met with some parents last week. We also, I've, I've spoken with the, uh, the school board uh, president or chair and uh, and the superintendent at, uh, at, at different points. Um, I'm in the same boat you are. I have an eight-year-old goes to, uh, you know, I think Glenwood and I, we go to Clayton, same, same situation though, two days, right? So two days a week, three days virtual. The, the two days that you're virtual are a class in the morning and a class maybe in late morning for 20 minutes on Zoom and, and it's, uh, you know, it's tough. And I hear the same things you do. You know, I miss my friends. I want to, you know, I want to be able to go and do sports or be able to be in class. I'd be in there five days a week if I could. So um, it, we're going to have, we're going to have issues, I think, dealing with the ramifications of the decisions that, that every school made and just the, 
the pandemic in general. They are working on it. You saw recently a, um, a survey that went out to uh, Vestal parents that I believe is the first step that uh, to, to try and getting back to four days. They have told me uh, routinely that they had took uh, or taken a, a conservative approach in their um, in how they went about everything. So they've got three major issues: transportation being one, staffing being another, and space is another. And if you want to talk about any of those in particular at length, I'd be more than happy to to spend uh, time letting you know uh, everything that uh, that we've gone through to try and help. We're trying to get uh, kids back in a, as safe a way as you can. And uh, we're certainly asking the board to be more transparent. I, I told the superintendent and the school board that I thought that their communication was, was lacking to say the least. I think that dialogue with parents has not been great. And I think they, they haven't done a good job being transparent about how they made their decisions. I think that's really where they've fallen down because I think a lot of parents in Vestal in particular, there's just a lot of uncertainty as to what, what the next step is gonna be or how do you get there? What are the metrics that they're gonna use? They are doing their survey right now. I, that survey has to be completed, I believe this week. They're gonna take that back in and then they'll start working on their next plan. The, in short, what I would tell you is if you haven't done it already is contact the school board, let them know about your concerns uh, in particular and contact the superintendent. That was one of the things that they asked us to let people know was, uh, you know, because I, if you, if you believe them, they, they didn't seem to think that they got a lot of feedback. I, I find that hard to believe given the parents groups and the organization that's uh, out there that they haven't received a lot of direct feedback on, on the plan, but that's, uh, that was one of the things that they mentioned. So I'd encourage you to do that, but we'll have our contact information up afterwards. If you want to talk about it more, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk to you and certainly help in any way I can. So, um, all right. Chairman, thank you. Uh, just a couple of shout outs and I'm going to get to the next uh, question. We have a couple of young men on the line. I see Cole and, uh, and Lander. It's just nice to see young people uh, joining us uh, on, on these uh, virtual town halls. So uh, thank you both for that. I hope you found this uh, informative. And I think it's pretty cool that, again, there are uh, some youngsters on the line, uh, young New Yorkers, uh, young men from the 52nd Senate District uh, who are uh, involving themselves in uh, the, the process, right? I think that's pretty cool. Also, uh, a couple of my friends from organized labor, specifically the building trades, uh, I want to give them a shout out. They're doing great things in this community and keeping us pointed in the right direction. And uh, last but not least, uh, Bishop Mario Williams. Uh, Bishop, I see you. Uh, thank you for all that you're doing in our community. Uh, uh, the bishop, uh, for all of your uh, edification, has been very, very involved in uh, these police reform discussions that are currently taking place, uh, not only in the city of Binghamton, but also uh, for the county of Broome. So uh, the bishop is somebody that my wife and I hold very uh, near and dear to our heart um, uh, personally, uh, but also just want to um, uh, thank him for everything that he's doing um, uh, professionally as well. With that, uh, Chip, we're going to unmute you and uh, take your question. I think you're set. Thank Jim. you, Senator. Thank yes, you sir. for hosting this meeting. I, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to, first of all, compliment. Uh, it's nice to see my county legislator in attendance and also a former student of mine from some years back in the Russ Corners area. Good to, to see the two of them. Um, I hope I can be heard. Yes, you can. I would like to uh, just on a positive note, I had the opportunity today to uh, take a brother of mine to get his COVID vaccine shot this afternoon. Uh, we attended the Bingham or the Johnson City site in that big white tent. I, uh, we, we entered the tent at 10 of three we left the tent at 325, that was 35 minutes, and 15 minutes of that included sitting down in a chair and uh, waiting to make sure my brother was okay after getting the shot. Uh, I never was in the company a uh, better run than that site. Uh, the uh, National Guard people, the uh, young people, and older that were working there were so hospitable and friendly. 
uh, it was quite a nice experience. Uh, very good. And uh, that's pretty much it. I see the news when I see pictures of Florida or California where people are sitting in a car for eight hours waiting to get the COVID uh, vaccine. Mm. I, I don't understand it. Uh, New York, at least in upstate New York, is doing it right. And I just wanted to pass that along. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed this evening's town hall. Chip, thanks for being with us. Uh, the feedback is good. Um, I would um, also offer that uh, the county site at the, at, at the ICE Center at BCC is running uh, incredibly smoothly as well. Uh, the Broome County Health Director, Rebecca Kaufman, uh, and her team uh, are doing uh, an exceptional job. I think the chairman and the county legislators uh, would, would agree. So just uh, appreciate the feedback. Uh, it's obviously we want to, for those of uh, you that, that want the vaccine, uh, we want to be able to vaccinate as many people as we possibly can, uh, of course, that, that want the vaccine. So it's good to hear that both the state-run site uh, and, of course, the county-run site are, are functioning um, appropriately. So thanks for that feedback. Always good to see you, Mr. Kinney. <laughs> you did. Oh, sorry. Mr. Kinney, what did you teach when you were 12? I mean, uh, you had you had to have, right? <laughs> He's got it. There you go. Uh, man, I, um, I was an elementary, an elementary teacher, basically. Fifth grade, mm -hmm. um, Ross Corners Elementary School in Vestal. Yep. And some other buildings. Uh, Great vocation. That's and great. Both of us. I had him as well. Very, very cool. Uh, Emmanuel, if you'd be so kind, uh, uh, Beverly Rainforth, please. Thank you. Um, I also have um, a lot of concerns about the survey, but I'll email you about that um, so that uh, in the interest of time. Um, so in, um, I believe it was countywide, Broome County had the last property evaluation in 1993 and 94. I don't know if it was statewide um, at that point, but I look, uh, there's been a lot of discussion locally about um, how long it's been and how much has changed since that um, 25 years ago, uh, 28 years ago, 18 years ago. Um, the IBM has moved out, the university has expanded into the community. A lot of the community um, housing has become student housing um, with bedrooms rented, uh, uh, houses rented a bedroom at a time. And um, so uh, um, it seems as though because we haven't had another reevaluation in all that time that there some real big inequities have developed. And um, New York State is one of about five states in the country that does not require a periodic reevaluation. Some states, it's every 10 years. Some states, it's every year. But in New York State, it's never. So i um, wondering if there's anything that can be done about that. Uh, Chairman, I'm, I, I got to be honest, uh, or Mayor, I'm not very well versed in this particular issue as it pertains to uh, the tax base and, and local governments. Could, could one of you, and I'm happy to educate myself on it, but could one of you or, or both of you opine on this issue? So um, it, it can be an issue and where you see it probably most demonstrably is between municipalities where one has done a reval like the town of Vestal and maybe like the town of Union where houses that are, are similarly assessed may be paying different rates for taxes. They try to do an equalization uh, rate for that to try to normalize everything. But uh, when, when it's been a while since they've done a reval, it's, uh, you, you, have a, you have the potential for things being out of line. And I think that's the, the inherent risk for it. But there's, there's there's problems with mandating it as well. I, I don't necessarily disagree that you need to find an equitable way to try to make sure that uh, properties are assessed uh, properly, but uh, I'm not a big fan just uh, having dealt with New York State on so many uh, mandates as, as it is that I'm not sure that passing another one back down to the municipality is probably the right way to do it. I think it's a, it's a tough 
ordeal because uh, invariably you're usually going to tick off at least a third of the municipality and the residents that are in it because of the way that the the burden shifts which you know you know you can make the argument i guess that 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 shift is is probably warranted but it assumes that uh, the reval is that when they do it is done properly and and just from my experience in vestal uh they had uh you know like a cape cod style house at the time when they did the reval uh some of the houses that were similar were assessed at 200,000 and then you had some that were assessed at 120,000 and the difference was that the the individuals got a hold of the people that were doing the reval and vestal for the ones that got to 120,000 and the $200,000 ones uh, just didn't connect with the, the people doing the reassessment. So you still had that inequity and it basically it puts the burden on the individual to go and, and challenge your assessment, which puts the assessor and the town in, in a position where they're holding a variety of hearings. And ultimately you can wind up having uh, an outcome that's very similar to what you had to begin with. It, in theory, it's supposed to be better, but in practice, it doesn't always work that way. So I don't know, Mayor, if you have anything Sure. Um, I, I'm going to speculate, maybe uh, incorrectly so, that um, the, the, the discussion, I may be referencing kind of some discussions that have been happening in the city of Binghamton. Um, I think that there are uh, some individuals, uh, primarily from the previous, you know, mayoral administration who have, you know, written some, some blogs and some postings, um, uh, putting out information that's you know, not really accurate or that's kind of been manipulated about what the history is and what some of the challenges uh, are in the city of Binghamton. Uh, I can tell you, you know, what our assessors, current, previous, and, and previous have indicated that you know, a citywide assessment in the city of Binghamton would cost approximately a million dollars to do. And they uh, speculate that you know, uh, a third, a third, a third. So for a third of the people in the city, um, there will be approximately no change in your assessment. A third of the people are likely to see a significant increase uh, in their assessments. And a third of the people may say, or may, may see uh, some varying degree of, of decrease. So, you know, there are approximately 47,000 people in the city of Binghamton. There are approximately a combination of call it 22,000 properties that are a combination of residential and commercial. Then you add on that in the city of Binghamton, you have a two-tier tax system for commercial and residential. And, you know, there, there begins to be some, some layers of complexity. Um, I do think that, or, or will recognize that in general, these things need to be done. Um, there probably uh, has been a long period of time regionally. Uh, and as the chairman said, there may have been, I don't wanna call it spot um, changes, but you know, different municipalities uh, probably have taken um, you know, varying steps. But I know that under the, the previous administration, there was an attempt to try to do something similar uh, that was uh, abandoned after a lot of commercial property owners, in essence, revolted at City Hall, um, that stopped that uh, effort dead in its tracks. And it's ironic because some of the same people who were involved in trying to advance at that period of time that abandoned it are now some of the same people saying, you know, even though we didn't do it, that you know, a new administration should look at it. I believe it, there was even one as far as in the assembly, there was gonna be a, a home rule change that was submitted that was, uh, pulled back at the last minute because uh, there was such hesitation and resistance uh, from you know uh, uh, a group of a group of individuals. I will add that I think many of you or most of you know that I, I'm term limited, meaning that uh, I've got about 10 months left uh, here in the city of Binghamton. It, it, it's not something that I would you know advance while I have just such a short period of time. Uh, in office, but I suspect that, you know, it may be uh, a discussion point during uh, the campaign or for, you know, a new mayor uh, coming in um, uh, to have to address. Um, I think that does dovetail into the overall tax issue, um, whether it's just in New York State in general, where the taxes are too high, one of the you know, highest uh, tax states uh, per capita in the nation, uh, with an exodus of people leaving uh, New York. And then I would also break it down more to a local level where uh, developers um, 
I, I deal with developers who say, you know, why should I build in Binghamton when it might be cheaper to build in Johnson City or Vestal or somewhere else, depending on you know, where the taxes are. And that that brings into the introduction of the payment and lose of taxes, et cetera. So uh, I know that's not exactly what, what the question uh, uh, was, but um, if, if there is going to be this approach, it probably should be more of a regional approach than a municipal approach, but you need to recognize that it's gonna be very, very expensive. Not that that should uh, you know, dictate it one way or the other, but it's also, you're gonna, you're gonna see, as I indicated, people who are gonna be very unhappy, people are gonna be real happy and people are gonna have no change you know, whatsoever. And I suspect that's why it doesn't get advanced um, very often. The uh, reason I directed the question to Fred, um, rather than um, you, Mayor David, or um, the county, is because I think it does need to be above the city level um, so that there's not competition across municipalities. Uh, and some people are said it should be at the city level, but I think that's a big mistake. So um, I actually, and I'm sure that there it would turn into another upstate downstate issue. But but it also seems like there are probably a lot of upstate communities that are struggling with the same issue because it's not ever required. 1994, last time. Beverly, I just want to make a point. Uh, your point is well taken. I wasn't trying to shirk my responsibility, but uh, for those of you that know me, um, I've never taken a position uh, on any issue uh, if I'm uneducated. Uh, so, you know, on this particular issue, if you'd be so kind and just allow me to educate myself a little bit more uh, before uh, I offer you an opinion about, uh, you know, my role or the state's role in the issue. Of course, I'd like to have a, a sidebar conversation with the mayor and, and uh, the chairman as well on the issue. So, uh, Senator, if, if I could just add, uh, you know, yeah. Beverly's point um, it, it is an accurate one with regards to uh, if you're going to advance it, it, it should look at more of a, a higher level, larger uh, approach. And if the state was going to advance that, they should consider a funding for that as well as opposed to an, an unfunded mandate. Because I, I think that would, you know, that, that is going to be a, a primary factor in it as well. But, but that view on it, I, I think, is the correct view. Fair enough. Um, to the staff on the line that uh, we're getting towards uh, the end of the question. If anybody else has a question, uh, could you just please uh, hit the raise hand uh, button and, and we're happy to take them uh, from you. But could you please share the screen uh, with our contact information uh, for everybody? I would just uh, note for everybody on the line, if we have not answered a question or left you uh, kind of wondering what the position is or you know, where we stand on a particular issue, uh, please just uh, reach out to us on, on any issue. If people are have uh, some concerns about a question uh, on our community voice survey, uh, please reach out. Uh, somebody on the staff uh, or I will walk you through any of the questions and, and further explain them uh, if in fact uh, you need them. Let's keep this screen up and um, uh, Mr. Vasquez, if you'd be so kind. Hello, everyone. How is everybody? You can hear me all right? Yeah, hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, generally, I, I think a lot of the problem that we're seeing right now uh, and many of the conversations that are happening is that we have a lack of faith, a lack of confidence in our government. And this is true at every level of government right now. Um, we're seeing that uh, there's a large focus that appears to be a disconnect from the rest of the public especially in New York State here, looking at our state legislature with no disrespect, Senator Aksher, I'm not picking on anyone. But I mean, when we see bills like A416, uh, A352, A466, we're talking about bills that have no connection to what the average person is going through and what I'm hearing from my friends and people in my neighborhood. We've lost 25 to 30% of our small businesses in this state depending on which report you're looking at. There's a projection uh, that has just come out that we could be looking at another 40% of our small businesses closing in the next six months. Uh, we need to have something that's going to be a real, concrete, effective change because we have some real serious questions that are driving people out of our communities faster and faster, which is then causing a domino effect of all the other problems that we've been discussing today in this meeting, which I'm very happy to hear about. But 
we need to reopen our businesses and our schools. We need to remove our governor because there is a direct and confirmed examples of corruption, and he has violated public officer law, uh, Article 74-H. So it's not a difficult process to get him removed on that case. We need to end these emergency powers that we've seen consistently abused at, at all levels of government and uh, is only adding to the problems, especially when we see changes on a daily basis that have nothing to do with science. You're, you can be open till 10 o'clock, you can be to open till 11 o'clock, you can be open till 12 o'clock. This makes no sense. And we have to get ahead of some of the problems that this process and this lack of connection has caused. I mean, as an example, the eviction crisis is coming. It keeps getting pushed back on the federal level uh, from January 1st to March 1st. Now it's looking at October 1st, but we're looking at this problem. It's going to happen. No one is talking about it and it's going to have a negative impact. So again, I, I say, I believe that part of it is we have a lack of faith and confidence. We have members of the state legislature that are not responding to constituents when they re when they receive emails and people contacting them, asking them questions. We're not seeing issues that people care about being addressed. I'll give you a great example. Uh, besides the eviction notice, what about the number of families that are being affected by the red flag laws? We know 624 people were uh, had actions put against them. We have no idea how many children have been separated from families, although we have the indication from the state that, fam that children have been taken from families and no one has responded on that. These are big issues. We have to address this lack of faith in our government and we have to do that quickly. Otherwise, everything continues to fall down. I think that's one of the key issues. It's just my thought on it. Well, I certainly thank you for your comments. And um, uh, while I'm not well versed in the bills that you uh, mentioned, I, I would note for everybody else in the line that they are assembly bills. Uh, and as you well know, Mr. Vasquez, I'm your state senator. Uh, if you have some concern with those assembly bills, I would uh, just uh, kind of point you in the direction uh, of Assemblywoman Lopardo, who is your representative uh, in that particular house. And, you know, I guess if, if I'm speaking globally about bills that make no sense, um, Oftentimes I see that, right, in, in the state Senate, in my respective house, things that, that, that come across your desk and to me and to my constituency, uh, they make no sense. And the only other thing I would say in terms of, um, you know, people being frustrated and, and your suggestion uh, about a, you know, I guess a, a government officials who uh, are not listening, uh, I would just respectfully uh, offer that those elected officials that are on the line today are in fact listening uh, and uh, taking into account everything that, that everyone is saying. So uh, we do have a lot of work to do. And to Mrs. Strauss's point uh, during the outset, uh, it's gotta be done collectively together. I mean, there's no way that we move this state forward if, if we draw lines in the political sand and say, well, you know what, it was a Democrat issue or, or an idea or it was a Republican idea. Um, so we're not going to deal with that because uh, I'm of a different political persuasion. We're never going to get ahead of the uh, ahead of the curve and and uh, you know come out of this pandemic if that's the attitude that we take. Uh, Manny, let's take uh, the last question from Lisa Addington, and then uh, I'll ask uh, the chairman and the mayor and uh, the legislators to offer some closing remarks, and then I'll offer some of my own. <clears throat> okay, shall I talk now? Shit, you're you're. Uh, you are unmuted. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I just want to say thank you for hosting uh, these town hall meetings. It's, um, you know, great opportunity to be able to just do this from home. So not a lot of excuse not to attend. Also, I'm trying to educate myself more on, uh, on you know, the kind of issues that a responsible citizen should be educated about. And uh, I also appreciate the, the questionnaire thing. <clears throat> My comment on the questionnaire is that some of the questions, the issues are way too broad and way too complex to give a yes, no answer. That's one thing, um, or you know, a, a simple answer. And the other thing is that it would be helpful maybe on some of the more complex issues 
to provide some links about like, if you didn't know really what this issue is about here, go over here, check it out. Um, or just, just some direction to, for people who want to understand a question more thoroughly. And that was it. Lisa, I appreciate that feedback. As I said earlier, I'm not sure if you were on the line uh, or, or you weren't. Um, it's actually very helpful, the feedback that we get in terms of the questionnaire. And I think that the, the chairman had kind of alluded to this earlier and, and I'll kind of say the same thing. You know, as I'm looking at the questions, uh, they all make sense to me, right? Because these are issues that I am I I'm have to deal with or, or that we're currently dealing with or make sense to somebody uh, that's currently working or representing you in state government. So um, I actually like your idea about links to the particular issues and I'll, I'll speak to my team about that. And it would be uh, kind of handy, right? If you could just click on that link uh, and to tell you about the uh, film tax credit uh, or AIM funding or whatever it may be. So um, I appreciate the feedback and uh, we'll certainly um, um, certainly take that into consideration and uh, try our very best to make sure that the links, uh, nobody can accuse us of the links being biased uh, either. So again, I just want to make one last point about the survey. Uh, I'm not trying to make it biased. Um, it's, not, it's not a Republican survey or a conservative survey, uh, a liberal survey, a democratic survey. It's, they just, these 15 issues happen to be issues that I'm, I'm, I'm currently dealing with uh, that will come across the, my desk uh, during this legislative session. Uh, Chairman Reynolds, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, and uh, your uh, county legislators and then uh, Mayor Dave. Thank you, Senator. And thanks again for, uh, for hosting us and having us here at the meeting. I, I think uh, tying in your survey, the survey in, in a lot of ways is like what this meeting is, right? It's supposed to facilitate dialogue. That's really uh, what all these meetings are about, whether it's uh, or, or attempts to try and get input from constituents. It's really to try and figure out what are the things that resonate with uh, residents? What are the things that you care about? We heard several different issues tonight and uh, we learned some things. We're going to go back and check on, on some things as well, just to make sure that uh, that we, we try to address the, the concerns that were brought up here tonight. So, uh, but I'd just like to say thank you and, and certainly uh, appreciate every, every time, everybody here spending some time to try and uh, uh, let us know what was of, of concern to them individually. And I always love hearing everybody's opinion. I'm the youngest of six. We grew up in a house and trust me, nobody agreed all, all the time on, on things. So it's always good to hear different opinions on on issues and I'm okay with that. And I'm, it sounds like e even though we may not all agree on, on these issues, uh, we certainly can all be uh, adults about it and, and certainly have a, a professional and adult discussion on, uh, on these issues. So thank you so much, all of you for, for, for participating in tonight. And, uh, and I appreciate Senator obviously letting us uh, be here as well. I don't know if any of the other legislators, uh, Cindy or, or uh, Jason or, or Greg that are still here tonight, I uh, had anything else to add to it, but uh, Cindy? Sure. Who's going first? Go ahead, Go ahead Cindy. Cindy. I, I do want to say that we are reaching across party lines. Um, this pandemic has made it very difficult to meet in person. We're trying our best to open back up the county to try and help these small businesses. Um, our hands are tied at some level but I think we've done a great job working across party lines. The county executive, you know, is a great example. Um, Fred, you have worked across party lines also. And I think that's the only way we're gonna come together. So keep on with your questions, everybody. We really appreciate it. Um, like I said, our, our link is there. Please send us some questions. Thank you. I'd be remiss too if I didn't mention uh, legislator Matt Hildebrand. I mentioned him earlier, but I, that that run you always run the risk when you start bringing up everybody's name that you're going to invariably forget somebody. But Matt's been here the whole night as well, and and certainly here listening to his constituents' uh, concerns also. So Cindy, you're exactly right. If if there are other questions, please please reach out to uh, to us and let us know. Yeah. Greg? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman. Yeah, thank you, uh, Senator, for hosting. Uh, you learn a lot at these things. And uh, I appreciate, sincerely appreciate everybody's input. We don't take it lightly. 
and uh, you know we try to do the best we can for you, uh, definitely. And I agree with the senator and uh, everybody else saying the R and D doesn't matter. We do the best we can for uh, Broome County. So thanks again. Keep uh, sending us your questions. Have a great night. Legislator Hildebrandt. Yeah, and just uh, thank you, Senator, for having us be here. We can see that this is uh, very beneficial for the residents of this area and for ourselves to, to get the feedback from, from people that are uh, that are living and working in our area, you know, the, the bus, uh, you know, some of the bus problems and, and some of the other issues that uh, are affecting us at uh, the state level. This is, it's really good. Um, I'm glad I'm part of it. And I think that, uh, you know, with this pandemic, this is a great way of still reaching out and, and communicating with uh, people on the, on the ground doing work every day. So I, I thank you for hosting these. And we have Legislator Shaw is with us still too. Yep, thank you, Chairman. And as always, thank you, Senator, for hosting this. Thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate the questions. And I really love how positive a vast majority of them were willing to work and find answers. So thank you everyone, have a good night and back to you, Chairman. All right, I think uh, at this point, I'll turn it back to you, Senator, thank you. Yeah, Mayor, if you'd be so kind just to offer some uh, parting remarks. Sure, folks, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. I appreciate the invitation, uh, Senator Akshar. I would, I would just add, um, if regardless of where you live, if there's anything I can do for you, uh, even if you live outside the city, feel free to email me directly. Feel free to call me. I'll help you any way I can. Uh, I appreciate the, the candor and the frankness of the discussion tonight. Um, and, I, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in these things. And you, you can count on me to, to show up, uh, Senator, as, as, many, as long as you're doing these things. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and to the county legislators. Uh, it's always good to be with you. And I uh, wish we were doing them in person, but uh, you know, I, I think probably uh, you know towards the latter part of the year we can we can get back to doing that. But nonetheless, I think this is uh, the way to do it. Uh, you know, in the safest manner possible. But um, you know, I pledged five years ago that I would always be open. I would always be accessible uh, and approachable to the people that I so proudly represent. So. Uh, this is one of the ways of doing it. And um, I've never had a town meet, a town hall meeting, whether uh, in person or virtually, uh, in which uh, we said somebody couldn't come uh, or, uh, you know, we stopped somebody from speaking. And, and to, to Legislator Shaw's uh, point, you know, I think it's good to have a little bit of discourse and, and, and back and forth and, and candid conversations about a whole host of issues. And uh, to all of the other uh, elected officials, I think, uh, Legislator Baldwin mentioned this. It really does. It, they, it, these conversations really are informative, right? And uh, whether it be a survey or one of these virtual town hall meetings, uh, it's really a good way to shape, uh, you know, public policy or the way somebody uh, will vote on a particular issue. So, uh, again, I don't want to, anyone to leave disappointed. So, if you didn't get to ask your question or uh, something uh, remains um, still up in the air and, and you weren't satisfied with the response. Uh, all of our contact information uh, is, is up on the shared screen now. And I would just encourage everyone uh, to reach out uh, to the county legislature, uh, to the mayor, as they both have offered, uh, or to our office. And I would just uh, one last time plug uh, the community voice survey, uh, which can be found at actchart.nysenate.gov. And again, if anybody has uh, particular questions uh, about any one of the 15 questions on the survey, please just call tomorrow uh, and somebody from the staff will I'll be kind enough to help you through um, any one of those issues. But uh, I just want to personally, uh, again, thank uh, my colleagues uh, from government uh, who are with us this evening. Thank all of you for joining us. And it really is a, a pleasure uh, to serve this community. And, and as I always say, uh, regardless of uh, the position in which I'm serving, uh, you have my pledge to always put our community first uh, when, we're, when we're moving issues. So again, thank you, everybody. Uh, stay safe and God bless.